Welcome to Round Rock Church of Christ. We're glad you're listening. If you're in the Austin area, we'd love to have you join us this Sunday at 8.30 or 10 a.m. Or you can check us out and watch online at roundrockchurch.us. May God bless you as you seek Him, and may He use this message to give you exactly what you need. It's the word of the Lord for you, church. Let me pray before you uh, sit down. Uh, So God, may you open our hearts and our minds by the power of your Holy Spirit this morning. God, the scripture that is read and as your word is preached, may we hear what we need to hear today. You just help us to receive all the promises that you've laid before us. Remove the distractions. And may we hear you clearly. Pray this in your name. Amen. In FC. I know so a couple of people in first service were like, I, you're throwing off my groove. Like, I, I know to be seated after the scripture reading. Don't do it again. <laughs> hey, uh, if we have not met before, my name is Zane Witcher. I'm the uh, preaching minister here. Uh, I have not been the one that's been up the past two Sundays. Uh, the leadership was extremely gracious and gave me two Sundays uh, to spend time in prayer and preparing preparing for, I should have prepared a little bit more, uh, pre- preparing for the next year to come. And I also wanted to thank Matt um, for stepping in and, and preaching last week. Uh, and I also, I just made a promise to God when I was out um, preparing uh, that I was going to come back and I was going to tell you all as a church. Um, thank you so much just for the patience uh, that you've had for me and my family. And thank you for uh, the grace of welcoming us here as we're almost up to one year. Uh, it's been good. It's been good. If, uh, if this is your first time at church or first time in a long time, today is a really good day to be here uh, because we're starting a new series. This series title is called The Process of Love. And the word process is very intentional being put next to the word love. And it's for a reason that many of you already know. That love is not always immediate, instant, or instinctual. Especially when it comes to loving them. Do you know your them in the world? You know the ones that it just takes a little more dosage of love. To be able to put up, I mean, to love, not put up with. (laughs) I'm talking about the people, like that person that you see on your Facebook timeline. That every time you see their name, you have to fight for your eyes not to roll to the back of your head. I'm talking about the family member who you try to dodge, but every Thanksgiving and Christmas they keep showing up. I'm talking about the neighbor who can't keep their yard together to save their life, and you got to pick up the slack. I'm talking about the co-worker who is never around when you need them, but they're always there to take the credit later. I'm talking about that mom that's on the committee with you that comes up with these ridiculous ideas, and it costs you more time and work. Do you know your them, church? Who is the person that takes way more love to be able to love? It may be on our best days, in between the comments where you're like, I can't stand them, and the days where you're like, I want no part of them. You scratch your head thinking, how do I love them? And that's where the series, the process of love comes into play. Usually we say something like this when we have someone really hard to love in our life. We're like, well, hey, you know what? I'm working on it. All right. Which is really interesting. For What does working on it mean? I guess it means like I'm going to try to love them again or I'm going to try harder to love them. And I know for some of us, we're like, that ain't going well right now. <laughs> what do you do to love someone that you feel kind of empty? with love towards. Uh, Maybe I can give you an image for uh, this series uh, that I think kind of hits this nail on the head. Uh, One of the things uh, my spouse and I do every week uh, is we try to go out to a new park and uh, we go and get lost uh, for a while. We do find our way back home, but we, we get lost for a while. We just go to new parks. I know. 
I'm younger. You're like, oh, I remember those days. All right. <laughs> we do that every week. And the first week that we actually came to Round Rock, we uh, went to this random park and we're walking a couple miles. Uh, and then we run into this letter that's on a picnic table. And this letter literally is just labeled on the top. It says, to anyone who needs love. And my wife says, we need love. We need to open that letter. And my response was, no, we do not. <laughs> we do not need it. We, uh, we don't need to open that letter. There's no reason. So what does she do? She begins to chastise me. She goes, you know what I'm saying? This is the problem with you. You're not open to small little gifts. Ways that God could smile upon us. Ways that we could do things to get you. It would be romantic. It'd be romantic if we opened this letter. So after a while, I'm like, you know what? Give me the letter. So I grabbed the letter. I was like, we don't even know if this thing's for us. She goes, turn around. I turned around. And literally, they had written on the back, it's for you. <laughs> Come on. Come on, somebody. So I just, I take this letter, and we have this really meaningful moment where we open it. Kind of. And I, I open the letter. And I, 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 I open it up and I dump out the contents. And you know what's in that letter? Absolutely nothing. Apparently the person who wrote to anyone who needs love didn't love us enough to actually give us anything that was in the letter. And I told her, I was like, see, this is why I don't do things like this. I don't ever let disappointment come into my heart because I never opened it up in the first place, you know, which I should probably process that later. But... That's a really good image of what this series is trying to do for you. You have someone in your life, someone that needs love. And when you reach deep down in your soul, deep in your heart, your love is empty for them. What if there were a different way than you just trying harder to love them? What if there was a different way than just trying to grit your teeth and be polite? What if there was a process to actually loving the them that is in your life? So each week we're going to walk through a question that if you go through this process, you will probably bump into these questions. Here's kind of an outline of where we're going for the series. Uh, week number one, how do I love them? Congrats, you're here at that sermon. Okay. Number two, what does God have to do with it? It's like very close to like, what's love got to do with it? You know? I was off studying, okay, so I had time for these things. All right, three, does it really matter if I love them? Number four, what does loving them actually entail? Number five, how do I love when they make it difficult? Some of you will be back for that one. All right, number six, what if they don't love me back? Each week for this series, we're going to tackle those questions in the process of you trying to love someone who is hard to love. And to do this series, we're going to be walking, we're going to be drawing from Scripture that Christians have identified as the letter of 1 John. And one of the reasons we go through like a whole book is so that we are covering every inch that is in the Bible. And as we go through side by side with these questions, we're going to walk through a different section of the letter known as 1 John. Because 1 John is written to a group of people who would be very empty on love. 1 John would be written to a group of people who know what it's like to have a falling out with people that they love deeply. The letter of 1 John would be people who want to know how to begin the process of loving again. And as we open the series today, as you just heard Natalie read the first four verses, I just want to start with the very beginning. Four verses of how John opens this letter. Because he opens it very simply for us to receive just something very simple. And what's interesting about how John starts this letter is it's very empty compared to most letters or epistles that you would find in the Bible. And I just simply want to highlight what those three things that are empty of in this letter that you would usually 
find with it because we may just find where the beginning of the process of love. In those first four verses, there's three things that are missing that would be common themes. Here we go. Number one would be names. Number two would be references. And the third would be courtesies. If you're a margins type person, if you like to take notes, these are probably the three things to write next to the margins of these first four verses. John just doesn't include these things like normal writers usually do. So let me kind of break down each of them. All right, first of all, names. Uh, Communication still has some of the same instincts that it has always had before, okay? Let me ask you this question. When you're put on a group text, when someone CCs you in a large email, when someone's parent sends an evite to a party, what is one of the first things that your instinct? I gotta know who else is included on this thing. Who else is showing up to this party? When early writers would write letters, they would include names. Think of it this way. Like the first paragraph of a letter is almost like, it's like this opening paragraph that's like a cocktail hour. Like people are throwing around names and they're exchanging names. They're trying to say, this is who I know. And this is who I'm also associated with. Like think of like, think of like the gospel of Matthew. Okay, like you read the opening of that book. And it's just name after name after name after name after name of people who are associated with Jesus. I mean, if you read that thing out loud, you need to sip a Gatorade afterwards. Like you're dehydrated. I like always question my reading level when I read some of these names. I'm like, maybe I didn't complete third grade. I don't know. (laughs) But John bypasses referencing these names. Did you notice in the first four verses, there are zero names of people that he's referencing to. But what's fascinating is that he can't get out names quick enough when it comes to God. Let's walk through this for a second. Starting in verse 2. This we proclaim concerning the word, that's a title, of life. The life, that's another one, appeared. We have seen it and we testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father, okay, we know that that's a title, and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also know and have fellowship with us and fellowship with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Zero names of people. Six names for God. It's almost as if John is saying, if you want to start with loving someone, you first have to start with the name of the God we know in Jesus Christ. There's a love to draw off of, to love different people. And this is not, this is not a popular idea whatsoever. You and I have walked through a world where we're pretty much convinced you don't have to have God to love people which I guess in some ways may make sense, but it's not always to the full extent in which we mean it, right? Because usually when we think, you know what, I'm a pretty loving person. Usually when you make that assumption off yourself, you're basing it off of the people that you've loved, which tend to be the people that are like in your tribe or in your circle or in your family. And when Jesus talks about love, He basically says things like, you know, what good is it for you to just love people who love you? Don't most people already do that? The type of love that Jesus talks about is one that's unconditional, one that's extending, one that's sacrificial. And this is why everyone, everyone needs Jesus. We may think we are really loving people with our immediate family. My question to you is, are you loving towards the family that you married into that drive you up a wall? We may think that we're a really loving parent and that we love our kids. But what about loving the parents who raise their kids differently and they think you should raise your kids differently? We may think that we're loving people because we care about people on the margins 
or neglected in society. But what about people that love politicians that do not necessarily care for those who are on the margins or neglected? We may be respectful. We may be loving towards people of different faith backgrounds. But are you just as loving to them as you are with people in this church that have a different view of what Round Rock should be doing? Friends, everyone needs Jesus. To be able to love those who are hard to love, we need a love that is outside of ourselves. A love that we can draw on. A love that is powerful. That can be outside of ourselves. That helps us to be selfless in our love. And that's why baptism matters. Like baptism is the act of going into water. And when you are brought down, someone says to you, over you, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's claiming a name that will guide your life and also empower your life. It's how you say yes to a love that is outside of yourself. And the question is, is will we accept the love that we cannot give ourselves? The first is John doesn't mention names. The second is this. John doesn't make references. Okay, so in in book of John, uh, traditionally, how we've identified the writer of John is also the person that we've identified as the gospel writer John. And also uh, the one that wrote Revelation, which you just heard from in communion. Uh, John is all over the place. And to describe John, John's kind of like that guy uh, in your friend group who uh, always has to make references based off of whatever show or hobby he's in right now. Like you got that type of person like in your life? Like that type that's like, hey, hey, have you seen that video yet? No, no, I, ha- I haven't seen that. Hey, have you seen that show yet? Uh, I quoted it. I, I don't know that. I don't know that. John, John would have like loved hashtag throwback Thursdays. Okay. He just would have loved it. Because anytime John is writing, he's always making these references to locations, to names, to phrases that happen. But what's really fascinating in 1 John, John isn't making all these references. As a matter of fact, John only makes one reference. In one one, he says, that which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked at and our hands have touched, This we proclaim concerning the word of life. John usually is dripping with references to different parts of the story of God. And he only mentions the beginning in the first part. Almost as if John is saying, if you want to talk about the love of God. We have to start at the very beginning. We got to go back to the fundamentals, to the basics, start from the top of where love actually flows down. Okay, this 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 one may be a stretch, but I'm gonna try it anyways. Um, I a uh, couple weeks ago I went uh, and saw the uh, movie Jurassic World, uh, and I'm not gonna share my my thoughts of it. Uh, I just have a suggestion about the movie. Uh, when you are going to go see the movie, I would just recommend uh, continue to drive down I-35 and uh, roll down your window. Uh, take your cash and stick it out the window and just let it go. And you will have just about as much fun of that. Okay. Uh, Like I said, I don't have a hot take. I just have a suggestion for you. (laughs) The reason I couldn't hit, hey, and God loves you. If you, if you love that, if you love that movie, blessings. Okay. Um, The reason I couldn't stand it was that it missed all the, I'm an OG. Okay. It missed all all of the magic that was happening in the first one. Like we just slowly declined the whole way. Like it was just brutal. Like it was missing people. Like one of my favorite characters in Jurassic World uh, is Mr. DNA. Okay. Yeah, you remember Mr. DNA. Mr. DNA was like this goofy cartoon that would like display on the monitors as you would go through the park that would actually lay out. Here was the process. And here was the intention of the creator. What's interesting, though, is I found out Mr. DNA, first of all, there's novels. Do we know that there's novels? Like they made the book before the movie, you know, blew my mind. Uh, That's me. Uh, But second of all, what's really interesting, Mr. DNA doesn't show up in the novels. 
And what's fascinating, at least from my understanding, is that Mr. DNA was created to basically make a quicker way of explaining to people, yes, the process, but more the intentions of the creators of Jurassic World. And when John begins this letter, he's referencing the Christian DNA. He's referencing the story of Genesis. That as this story unfolds, what you're seeing underneath is you're seeing the intention and the design that the Creator is laying in the world. And if John is saying this thing that he says at the very beginning of his gospel, of in the beginning, if he's saying the beginning as in how Genesis starts, he's saying the beginning of God's story is so important to the love that we now know through Jesus Christ. Let me give you three moments in the beginning of that story in Genesis. The first one is this. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. This is the first part of the story. And this is so important. This is so important to get right at the beginning of the story. That when the world was still formless, when the world wasn't perfect, when things were still taking shape, the Spirit of God cared, loved, and gave attention to the world. That the Spirit of God hovered. Like, that's like maternal language. Like, some of you, like, you had a hard time letting your kids go to school this week. Uh, one of you had a hard time with your kids going to school this week. Like, it was like that first time you let them go off to school and you just kind of lingered. You were like, maybe they'll miss me. Maybe they'll still see me. Like, that's the way that God is described in the beginning. And that is good news. That's good news for anyone who feels like their life is still taking form, who feels like their life isn't perfect, like their life's still trying to take shape, is that God cares and loves and gives attention to you, no matter where you find yourself. The second image, Genesis 1, 27, so God created mankind in his own image, and in the image of God, he created them, male and female. And then God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. This is massive. The first thing God does over humanity in the very beginning of the story is he doesn't give them a bunch of instructions. He doesn't come to them and tell them what's going to be wrong. God blesses them. And also, God doesn't see humanity as a burden. He says, bring it on. He actually says, create more of them. And then the third in Genesis 1.31, God saw all that he had made. And it was very good. And there was evening, and then there was morning on the sixth day. When God looks at humanity from the very beginning, the very existence and essence, he calls good. Which is the beginning story of saying, God blessed and delighted in humanity. In other words, God loved and God loves humanity that's the story from the very beginning period it's the story that the bible tells us but it's not the story that we tend to tell ourselves if i were to pull some of you and i'll just say you know tell tell me a story of god real quick like some of you would probably give a version like this you'd say uh you know god created the world uh and then humans messed it up uh, and then humans kept messing it up. And then Jesus came uh, to help save us from messing it up. And then uh, now we're forgiven and empowered to hopefully not mess it up as much. When John first writes a letter in the beginning, and when Genesis tells you a story about God, it is not about bad news first. This God blesses humanity. This God loves His creation. And this God doesn't turn his back on them. Maybe one of the best imagery uh, would be uh, just like the uh, creator of uh, the Apple product that's in your, uh, in your pocket or your purse right now. Uh, when Steve Jobs did the first creation that led to all the iterations of different Apple products that we're all just kind of floating around in now. 
when he built his first laptop, one of the things that Steve Jobs did, not laptop, computer, my bad. Um, he knew he struck gold with such a creation that he took a sheet of paper, he laid it out on a desk, and he asked everyone who helped him to create it to put their signature on the paper. And then what Steve Jobs did in the first iteration of it is he actually took the signatures and he had them engraved inside some of the first computers. And people still even have some pictures of what this looks like. Most people would never see this, but it mattered to Steve Jobs as the creator because he knew his signature on one of the best things he accomplished was there. I guess what I'm trying to say is this. God, who made you, you are his signature. You are his best creation. You are the one. Before we get into any other part of your story, he is the one that values you, sees you as sacred, and loves you basically off of your existence. Christians would sometimes say it like this. God loving you means that God just loves that you exist. His signature is inside you. And some of you are like, right, right, right. I got that. I got that. What about sin? Like we got to get the same. We got to get serious about sin. Like what about the things that like I'm not good at? What about the thoughts that I've had that no one else knows that I've had? What about things that are wrong with me in the world? And what John would say at the beginning of this letter is that Jesus Christ coming into the world in flesh is affirmation about what has been true about God ever since the beginning. That Jesus Christ is the yes to what God started. Which means something beautiful about God's love, church, and I hope we're a church that can amen things like this. But that in Jesus Christ, there is nothing you can do to increase the love of God that God already has for you. And in Jesus Christ, there is nothing you can do to decrease the love of God that God has for you. And God in Jesus Christ is the reality that God still loves and sees the signature in his creation. The question isn't if God loves you. The question is, will you receive the love of God that is before you? The third thing that John leaves out is courtesies. In a lot of letters, you get these eloquent kind of like sayings and phrases that come out of these writers. Like they're like the phrases that like Hobby Lobby and Magnolia, they're just making a killing off of us, right? Like you've got seven in your house right now. Like eat, love, and pray. That's not in the Bible, by the way. <laughs> just, just want that to be uber clear. Most writers have these eloquent phrases that happen when they're introducing their right. Not John. Not John in the first four verses. When John starts the letter, he gets right to it. He's like, I'm telling you about the love of God that can be heard, that can be seen, and that can be felt in your life. You know, be straight with me, okay? Have you ever had just moments in your life where someone says to you, you know God loves you. And you think deep down, yeah. And then like ministers like me get up here and I'm like, no, 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 you don't get it. God loves you. And you're like, okay, so you think just because you yelled it, now I feel it more? <laughs> what do you do when people say God loves you and it falls flat? Well, John reveals that to us. God's love is not a cliche. God's love isn't just a courtesy. It's not something that we just say when we don't know what to say. God's love is personal and it is relational. Just like a friendship, God's love needs to be received in different ways based off of the different seasons that we are in life. One of the temptations about the love of God is when you experience it one way, you keep trying to reach for that same way. When in reality, what growth with the love of God looks like is we keep opening ourselves up to different ways 
to receive the love of God. This is why some of us struggle. Like if you grew up at a summer camp and you had this amazing experience, like praise God for that experience. But also part of growth with God is having more of those experiences in different ways of working out the love of God, which means we need to know our personalities really well if the love of God is personal and relational. So some of you in the room, you're thinkers, right? Like you're the type of person that you're like, man, I love me some like good study, you know? That's like my jam. Like if you're the type of person that if you don't know something and you're like, give me a couple hours, I'll become an expert at it, okay? That's not normal. That's not normal for both, most of us, okay? If you're a thinker, one of the ways that you open yourself up to the love of God in a different and fresh way is to actually go out, leave the book, leave the book, leave the book. Go out and go help someone who didn't ask for your help whatsoever. For some of my thinkers in the room, and this, I, I am speaking to Round Rock Church of Christ. For some of my thinkers in the room, if it's time for the love of God to be refreshing to you, what you desperately need to do is you need to open up your mouth and you need to sing. Sometimes when it's so hard, you get so in your head about God. Sometimes we need to sing out loud. Our kids need to hear us sing. Our brothers and sisters in Christ need to hear us sing. And sometimes singing actually opens us up to something that we didn't even expect in ourselves. And now the thinkers are like, get off me, okay? Some of you are feelers in the room. <laughs> They're the people who go, yes. <laughs> Some of you love emotion. Some of you love stories. Some of you love feeling feelings. You're the, if you're a feeler, you're the type of person that you're sitting on a park bench and you're about to get up and then someone sits next to you on the park bench and you're like, oh, I don't want them to be alone. I'm going to stay on the park bench for another minute. Okay, that's a feeler. If you're a feeler, Sometimes one of the best things you can do to open yourself up to the love of God is not just feel the things you believe, but actually go study and spend time and look at history and look at why Christians have believed some of the things that you feel and you claim to experience the love of God in a new way. And some of you are doers in the room. You're the bit. Yeah, yeah. I deeply appreciate the vocal feedback of this sermon. Some of you are doers. You're the person that was like, this sermon should have finished 15 minutes ago so I could go out there and actually do something compared to just listen to you talk. And when we're doers, sometimes the way that we open ourselves up to the love of God is we simply need to stop doing, stop fixing, and we need to sit in silence before the Lord. And we need to experience His presence. I'm not saying these are the only ways to receive the love of God. I'm just saying if the love of God feels like something that you're like, it's just a cliche, it's just a statement, then it's time to open yourself up to maybe receiving the love of God in a different way. John uses this wording. We proclaim to you that what we have seen and what we've heard, notice those are different sensory, so that you may also have fellowship with us and fellowship with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. This word fellowship in the original language, its roots of it is a business term. It's actually a word that would be used in business to say that we share the same objectives, which means we also share in the same things. In essence, what John is saying is God's love is his business. Love is the business of God. And anytime you seek to love someone, you're also seeking to love God, which means that you are in God's business. If you want to love someone who is hard to love, maybe one of the first steps is stop trying to give what you have not received in your heart yourself. To receive the love of God. Love is like breathing in the Christian faith. We breathe in the love of God to be able to breathe out the love of God to other people. I don't know about you, but the times where, and I've done this in seasons, where I just try harder to love someone, I just grit my teeth more 
The only thing I find is I'm exhausted at the end. If you find yourself exhausted, then maybe it's time to relook at the God who loves you, who loves that you exist, and whose love wants to come through you. Because if we ask the Holy Spirit to give us a fresh wind of God's love, you may just find yourself in the process of love again. So let me pray for us. Uh, Lord, as we, as we dwell next to these words for the next couple of weeks, God, some of us are, are craving, some of us are pleading, some of us are complacent. And we need to hear and feel and see your love again. God, I pray for anyone in the room who do, does not know that there is one who is a creator, one that loves them, who created their existence. God, I pray, will you come close to them today and this week for them to know that there's someone who loves them and there's someone who hovers over their life. And God, frankly, for some of us, some of us who have been doing this for a while, God, we need you to refresh us in your love. Can you refresh, not in the surface level love, God, can you reveal to us the love that is seen through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ again? Can you help us to see what we first saw that first moment that we started following you? Refresh us, Lord, and we do this in Jesus' name. We all pray together. Amen.